time. Um, this is an example of character encoding being broken. Um, you see the interface looks fine, except when we punch through some uh, Chinese characters and we get gobbledygook um, coming up here. I, this is actually from an actual customer app. That was a, some e-learning app uh, we worked on a, a few years ago. Uh, and we were, you know, sort of showing that you couldn't input those functions either. Um, and uh, the reason why here is, you know, first of all, this is a nice little cheat sheet. Uh, if you want to learn more about character encoding, if you want a nice Unicode primer, uh, you'll find this along with lots of articles and white papers on lingoport.com under the resources uh, heading. But in any case, this example is just shows that, you know, something that we often don't think about is that there's a lot of zeros and ones that actually are behind um, how a letter shows up on your screen. So in this case, this is, you know, we're just showing the zeros and ones behind a few encodings. But different character encodings support different levels of complexity in your, uh, I'll say, alphabets or ideographs. So uh, ASCII might be very good for English, but you need uh, eight bytes uh, to render most European characters with the added accents and additional characters, say, in German, uh, that you have. Um, so you need to add on an extra zero. Um, if you go to, say, Japanese or, or uh, Chinese, commonly people call them the double byte languages, what that's referring to is that it takes two sets of eight bits or uh, two bytes to render them because there's just so many more of them. Um, and there's various ways of handling it. I, I won't get into the differences of UTF-8 and UTF-16. Um, safe to say that there are just uh, uh, different ways of rendering more complex uh, uh, scripts uh, that happen across uh, worldwide um, uh, ways, uh, languages. So in any case, um, uh, uh, what happens is, like, when there's too many zeros and ones, some applications just break fundamentally, and you see square boxes or garbage like that. You've probably gotten spam email like that with lots of square boxes, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, now, again, the, the benefit on uh, internationalization is you've got a one-time higher initial cost, but once it's in place, you're more in a maintenance standpoint. You, you've got to follow certain standards, but your big hit is over. But then the beauty of it is you have really good leverage localization from version to version. Um, you have a lot less work as you update the versions in your localization as well as just much more efficient product that can go worldwide. It's very important for companies' revenue uh, pictures. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we approach getting started on a new project. You know, uh, uh, some of this may be, you know, helpful in terms of framing new projects and ongoing efforts for yourself. So first of all, the problem with any kind of a new project is, is well, it's just big. Um, a lot of the work that Lingoport gets involved with, I'd say a small application might be 100,000 lines. Uh, uh, we have worked on projects well north of 5 million lines of code. So one of the first problems is, is well, you've just got so much code, where do I start in terms of how to fix things? Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of work that has to be happened just to take apart this, this product that, you know, may be around a year, it may be around 15 years. Certainly, you know, that would be a long time in software life, but we, you know, we see it. We, we worked on a product uh, that had been around for quite a long time last year. Uh, and uh, a little bit this year, we had another one that was around since the early 90s. Um, so there was some real legacy in there as well as lots of new stuff. Um, but those that has a very significant uh, effect in terms of reining in your requirements um, and reining in your architectures. So these are big, big system projects. Um, you know, particularly it becomes interesting with you know, the migration from traditional Microsoft technologies like VB to uh, .NET technologies. Um, uh, there's, you know, changes in how developers work. 
There's changes in your testing requirements. There's a whole big budgeting question. How much is this going to cost? And then, you know, out there in the distance, sometimes uh, initially people are thinking, well, there's localization out there, but I don't really know how to deal with it. So from the internationalization process, there's a lot of planning, market requirements, ar architectural requirements. There's an extensive code review activity, uh, design activity, implementation, testing, and beyond. So um, this is a, a, you know, localization preparation. Do you want to take this part, Eric? Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Adam. No. Um, in further to what Adam had just gotten done saying, um, you know, knowing your requirements early, um, and then as far as, you know, knowing the market, not just its um, locale specifics, but the nuances about, you know, what consumers want in relation to your product that's going to make it more successful for that audience. And, you know, part of that, again, is having your, your team in place early, um, as well as, you know, whether that's in-house or consultants, vendors, partners, however you refer to them. Um, but, you know, for regulatory affairs, for um, uh, product functionality and support requirements, you know, there's, depending on the type of product and what you're delivering to, there's all varying layers of, um, of I guess, if you will, regulatory complexity. And, you know, establish that team. Don't be afraid to do that face-to-face -face if necessary. And, um, you know, put the right minds on the right task so that, that someone is it's, it's all focused, basically. And, again, when you get through to the validation stage where you're looking at, um, you know, um, validating the localized product, make sure to establish um, a, a customer-based in-country review process, which means that you've really got an audience with um, either your senior marketing people and or the people that are closest to the customer, if in fact not some of your longest standing subject matter expert customers who would work cooperatively with you to, uh, to validate the material. And again, if you're working with a third-party validation, it's still a cooperative effort to put out an overall better product. So don't look at it as a test or a challenge. Um, make sure that you're taking a collaborative and cooperative approach. That would be what I would, That's again, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Again, and then the, um, the stakeholders, as I just talked about, these are all people to consider in that process. Um, you know, this is your voice globally. Uh, it touches your entire organization, as well as, you know, it takes the brand, um, the brand and the face of your product to a broader audience. So. Um, you know, no one, no one uh, can or should really shy away from um, internationalization or localization support effort. Um, you know, it's a, an opportunity to learn and um, gain both corporate <clears throat> and personal business intelligence from each other from varying perspectives.